Project Opioid is a nonprofit that focuses on how to bring leaders together to implement solutions in their community. Often we know what needs to be done to impact lives, but who is going to do that work at a community level? That's what Project Opioid is all about. And so you read the top headline, I think for a lot of you guys this is gonna be important. Like many social issues, the opioid crisis cannot be solved by government alone. Government is gonna to struggle to solve social issues uh, without the partnership of the business community, the faith community, hospitals, law enforcement. So Project Opioid seeks to bring together leaders in communities around the state and now around America to save lives. Uh, let me take just a minute to recap the overdose crisis here in Florida. Wherever you live in Florida, these numbers apply to you. Really, if you're from somewhere outside of Florida, these numbers gonna, are going to apply to you. So if we thought we had an overdose crisis before the pandemic, we all knew the story of an incredibly high rate of overdoses in America before the pandemic. What you see now since 2020 are overdoses and overdose deaths, the likes of which we could have never imagined. Overdoses climbed to over 100,000 deaths in America in 2021, and that number shows no sign uh, of receding. As a comparison, in 2001, 17,000 Americans overdosed and died. By this time next year, the prediction is 117,000 Americans will overdose and die per year. And I do want to say this, we'll dive into this a little bit more later. This is a, an epidemic that's killing our young people. It is killing a generation of young people. It's affecting millennials. It's affecting vulnerable communities. For many of you, if I were to ask you, what is the average age of your workforce? 37, 32 depending on the industry, maybe 41. For all of your industries, for your employees, the number one cause of death now is death by overdose, mostly to opioid. That's the number one cause of death of your employees uh, in, in every one of the companies represented in here. Unless your employees are 50 and 60 years old, the average age, and it's still, um, still high on those lists, but if you're younger than 40 years old, it's the number one cause of death. So in Florida, this is, this is what you want to see for your stocks or your cryptocurrency. This is not a chart you want to see for overdose deaths. But if you look from January of 2020 to now, 42% increase in deaths in just two years. It's, it's really, just for context, nothing like this has ever happened in American history. There's no precedent for this level of an increase in deaths. Um, we've never seen suicide go up by 42% in two years. Or, or this is, so there's really something going on here that is, uh, again, without precedent. And how many of you have heard of that new drug, fentanyl, that, that you're seeing in the news? So I want to show you fentanyl. See that red line? That is fentanyl deaths um, in America. And some, a point of clarification, fentanyl, if you Google that word, what will come up is a drug that was created by Janssen Pharmaceutica, I believe in 1960, Paul Janssen created it. It's often used in hospitals for, for those that are, are having surgery done. This is not what is killing people. What's killing people today is an illicit version of fentanyl that is made with chemicals from Chinese laboratories brought, smuggled into Mexico. The drug is created in Mexico. And this is the drug causing the spike in deaths. I almost feel like as a, as a society, um, we could believe that prescription fentanyl is what is killing people. That is not the case. So this is now what you're seeing is a change in drugs in America driving this crisis. Uh, the, the tube on the right is the amount of fentanyl that would, that would cause an overdose and death compared to the same amount of heroin. That's how small a microdose of fentanyl can be fatal. You've seen all kinds of reports of late of um, 
uh, law enforcement officers touching the drug and having a fear that there's an overdose happening, you know, we're discovering a whole new wave of weaponized substances. Really what's happening, and I won't dive into this too much, drugs are just completely changing in America. We, you know, we've had a really interesting uh, culture in this country when it comes to drugs for the past 40 years. It was um, Ronald and Nancy, love them, just say no, right? Just say no. And then, as a society, we couldn't say yes to drugs fast enough in our culture, if you will. Scarface sitting in front of a pound of cocaine and the Wolf of Wall Street and the 80s and 90s were a very contradictory message in this country where many people experimented with drugs. It was almost like a rite of passage in our culture, yet we didn't really teach people about the dangers of different types of drugs. Kind of a, kind of a odd situation. But now drugs have changed. And what the first thing I want you guys to know about this overdose crisis is that when you look at fatal overdoses in Florida and around America, um, fatal overdoses are being driven by fentanyl. I'm going to show you guys in just a minute um, how fentanyl is made. It's important, though, that you guys realize that for your employees, if they are experimenting with drugs in any way, they are in exponential danger compared to where they were even five, six, seven years ago. Fentanyl, the fentanyl that's killing people in these numbers, did not exist in this country at any legitimate level before six or seven years ago. So it's a new drug crisis. That's why Project Opioid, bringing leaders together. Um, we currently have seven, ten Project Opioids. First one started in Central Florida. We have a Project Opioid in Jacksonville that's just started. Tampa just launched Project Opioid St. Pete, Palm Beach, Miami. A lot of our Florida work funded by Florida Blue and the Florida Blue Foundation. So if I got any Florida Blue people in here, we love you. Thank you for that support. But over the next few months, we're going to be launching Project Opioids in over 100 communities in America and bringing leaders together uh, to combat this crisis. What do we want leaders to do and what can you be a part of in your community? Bring together a coalition that can drive change. Corporate America can be a big part of that. Look at the data so we understand how to help your employees in ways that we weren't able to help them before, and look at what that community can do to offer solutions. Why is it important for a community to work together right now? I think you guys saw just yesterday, I, these slides were made last week, J&J, &J, uh, one of the distributor, distributors of opioids, um, $26 billion settlement money to be get distributed, much of that in Florida, two billion of that coming to Florida. Yesterday, CBS settled with the Attorney General of Florida, 900 million more dollars given to cities, counties. But if we know anything about uh, what we saw historically with the anti-tobacco settlements, often you know that money doesn't impact the lives of people that need it. So there's this moment right now where leaders can create opportunities in their corporations, in their churches, across their regions, and that's what Project Opioid seeks to do. Many of our leaders, uh, uh, Kim Loftrup, who up till just a few weeks ago was the CEO of Red Lobster, Sheriff Dennis Lima, other community leaders from around the state working with us to bring solutions. What's that look like in, in the final product? It looks like when you have an employee that struggles with opioids and they reach out for help, that help is made available to them. Um, and that's, that's what Project Opioids is all about. So let me dive in now and talk a little bit more about how dangerous drugs are becoming in this country, in this state. I think I showed you guys that fentanyl earlier. How many of you saw the West Point cadets? And West Point, kind of a nice place to go to school and, and to get an education and serve your country. Well, there was a group of West Point cadets that were here on spring break. They decided to mess around with drugs, not the best idea, but they thought they were buying cocaine. They thought they were buying cocaine, and cocaine, not a drug you probably want to use, probably not something that's good for your life, uh, but they, you know, they thought they could experiment with that drug and do it in a way that they weren't putting themselves in a tremendous amount of danger. 
What they didn't realize, though, is that that cocaine, much like most street drugs in America now, is being replaced with fentanyl. It wasn't cocaine. It was a white powder made to look like cocaine that was basically just some of that fentanyl, white powder. They ingested it. Three of them, as I was told, began overdosing. One of them tried to give the other one CPR and overdosed because of what of ingesting the fentanyl giving the person CPR. So this is how dangerous this drug is. Um, another incredibly scary part of this, and this is for those of you that, again, HR, you work in the HR department, you're working with your benefits packages, you're working with insurers. Now, pills like oxycodone that you know, we, we wanted to be careful about these drugs before. We, we didn't want the real oxycodone pills winding up in the wrong hands. Now what you're seeing is the, those pills being replaced with fake oxycodone, Adderall, Percocet, any pill that used to be diverted is now being pressed by the Mexican cartels and drug dealers into fake versions that again are just fentanyl and baking soda. So, and you say, well, that, that can't be many of those pills. This is from the DEA just a, a couple months ago. Two out of five of the fake pills that are now in your community that your employees could be taking contain a lethal dose of fentanyl. This is why deaths are skyrocketing. And just look since near the beginning of the pandemic, fake pills are skyrocketing and listen, you know, if some of your employees don't have insurance, right, a lot of the industries we work in in Florida, we have many people that have insurance, then we have a large majority of special service, especially service industry jobs, people don't have insurance, they're often trading, getting pills diverted. They're getting a, uh, they're getting a prescription from someone else because they do not have insurance to cover that prescription. I had a friend that was uh, over at my place. He was, he was having a tough time. You know, in a relationship he was in, and he said, yeah, I was so stressed out, I asked, a, uh, he's in construction, he said, I asked a, a guy on the, uh, on the work at our job, and he gave me uh, a Xanax that, that he had gotten from his doctor to calm me down. I was like, listen, don't ever do that again. Never, ever, ever get a pill from someone, even if you think it's a prescription pill, because they are all now becoming fake pills made to look like prescription pills, and now they're counterfeits filled with fentanyl. So this is kind of the new crisis where it used to be we had to just be afraid of drugs like heroin. Now every, every drug is becoming fentanyl. Cocaine, heroin, any drug you might take if you're experimenting with drugs. And now even if you're trying to get your prescription filled in a non-traditional way, you can take fentanyl almost 50% uh, of those doses would be fatal. All right, so you start thinking about, I'm talking about drug dealers creating fentanyl, the Mexican cartels. I think some of you have watched Breaking Bad and your first impression of how these drugs are made is Walter White in some nice clandestine lab that, that drug dealers have put a bunch of money in. It's, you know, we hope the cops don't bust it, but it's got great equipment, they've got beakers, they've got, uh, they're testing the drugs to make sure it's made properly. If you were to think that that is how fentanyl is made, boy oh boy, do you have um, the wrong idea. This is actual footage of fentanyl being made by the Mexican cartels. All of it is made by the Mexican cartels a few miles below the border, smuggled across. This is young men in Mexico, many of which die, making fentanyl with broomsticks in a field. This is how it's made. Being watched over by the cartels. Remember how little of that can kill you? This is how it's made. Then, how do you, how do you titrate the smallest amount of that can kill you, then this, this powder is refined, put into substances, and these substances then given to your kids, 
the kids that play for your, your high school team, pressed into pills, given to people looking for drugs. Guys, this did not exist six, seven, eight years ago. The, that's the thing I have to stress to everyone. The drug crisis from six, seven years ago and the drug crisis today, they are not the same at all because of really the weaponization. Technology is great. It's helped us in so many ways in our society. But this is technology and chemistry gone the wrong direction, and it's not going back. You're going to see these drugs be um, uh, at the forefront of this crisis going forward. So this is why your advocacy is important. One of the things I would tell you as an HR director, many of you are in HR, many of you are corporate leaders, you've got to be able to look to create we talk about three C's at Project Opioid for a corporate leader, for a business person, for an HR director. Three C's. Look to create a new conversation in your company. Look to create a new connection to help and a new culture when it comes to drugs. I'll talk about that more a little bit later, but conversation, connection, and culture, three C's for those of you in corporate America. Those of you, some of you are here and your corporation might be a faith community. You might run a church. Boy, you can be incredibly impactful. This is a billboard campaign we've done called uh, the Everyone Campaign where we have looked to get this message out. Taking drugs is dangerous in a way it didn't used to be and now we need to get that message out. So how can leaders in corporations impact this crisis and save lives. We already talked about the, the initiative that we do in communities to really focus on who's at risk. Uh, you, know, you know, what's, what's really um, heartbreaking about the drug crisis is, so listen, I started Project Opioid and I had never struggled with drugs in my life. I, mean, I struggled with everything else in the whole world, but never drugs. Um, I'd never known anyone that struggled with drugs. My background is bringing leaders together to solve social issues, social innovation through leadership collaboratives. I've led some of the biggest initiatives in America on homelessness. I'm the founder of United Against Poverty, which is a big anti-poverty group. So when I started Project Opioid, um, you know, I probably came into this work with a lot of the same misconceptions that, that other people have. Here's a misconception I started with, that you know these people that take drugs, listen man, they just are making bad choices and they just need to make a better choice and this drug crisis is solved, right? Like, it's pretty simple. I mean, I, as an example, have always struggled to keep my weight where I want to keep it, right? Uh, you know, I, I'm one of those people that I've never seen a piece of pizza that didn't have my name on it. You know, I, I love carbohydrates, and and, um, and and so I've constantly, for years, my weight goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, depending on the decisions that I make. So um, I'm getting off a plane last week, coming back from Los Angeles. It's like midnight. I get in my car at the airport, and I'm driving back to my home in downtown Orlando. And suddenly, my dealers start calling out to me. You know, Wendy's, Taco Bell, McDonald's. My, my, my dealers, they're there. They're everywhere. And I pull in the drive-thru of Wendy's, and I'm like, you know, one chicken sandwich with fries isn't going to hurt me, right? Like, and I, I finally left the drive-thru, went home, and had a salad with some, you know, oil and vinegar dressings. The worst day of my life. But I'll tell you, here's what's interesting. I could have just as easily, you know, cheated on my diet and had a cheeseburger and had fries, had some pizza. And if I would have done that, I wouldn't have died. My bad choice might have set my diet back a day, but it wouldn't have killed me. This is what is happening to your employees. They are getting themselves mixed up with powerful drugs that when those drugs are ingested, they're the most addictive substances we've ever seen in the history of humans. I mean, oxycodone is the prescription version of it is incredibly addictive. By the way, do not take oxycodone for long periods of time if you can not, 
not do that. Um, for many of you, you've been a part of programs to reduce prescription opioids in the workforce. That's a great thing. We have, we have leaders in this room that do that work. That's a great thing. Um, but I would tell you, these drugs make oxycodone, these new versions of fentanyl, make oxycodone look like a jelly donut. 50, fentanyl is 50 times more powerful than morphine. And so these drugs, when you begin to take them, have an addictive power on the brain and body, the likes of which we just have never seen before. And so what we really try to talk about at Project Opioid is if we're helping people only when they overdose in an emergency room, they've gone to jail because they've been using these drugs long term, they've lost their friends and family, Boy, that is a terrible place to start giving people interventions. Do you know the best place, in our opinion, Project Opioid's opinion, to give someone help, the most successful place, is when they're not using drugs or they're just beginning to use drugs for whatever reason, prescription or non-prescription. And that is probably while they're still employed by your company. They're still able to, we're still able to give the most help to people who are not physically dependent and, and burning their social capital. This is why your ability to work in your company to educate those struggling is important. I'll talk for a minute about our CEO program. This is pretty cool. We've we invented this over the past two years. So we now have a program in Central Florida, a pilot program, where we're training um, CEO stands for Corporate Engagement on Opioids. Um, we train HR directors, CEOs, C-suite level um, individuals on how they can change their human resources and put new policies for their human resources. Um, EAP programs, often underutilized when it comes to, listen, most of your employees probably don't have insurance. That like the majority don't, right? This is the little secret that we all want to, you know, not address here. But through your EAP program, there are great strategies that can be used to help someone. Um, culture and connection, navigating someone who does have insurance, um, training, coaching programs, data and tracking. So this is our CEO program. Uh, uh, we can send this to you, but again, much of it has to do with education and culture, helping your employees know the dangers of new drugs and know what interventions can be most effective. So, you know, we'll, we'll be putting all this in a video that we're sending out, but I will tell you that you can create an environment for your employees where you can make a huge difference in their life, in a family member, let's say one of your employees has a family member who's struggling, this training can be incredibly important. For those of you in Central Florida interested in this training, we are doing it currently through our partner at CareerSource Central Florida. You can put in Forte, F-O-R-T-E, into Google, uh, put in CareerSource Project Opioid, and what will come up is our new opioid and overdose awareness training, uh, HR training, healthcare and recovery focused career training. A lot of these trainings are fully covered. They, they don't cost anything because of a grant we got through the federal government. So again, encouraging many of you to think about inside your company, how are you going to, how can you educate your employees on again, the new dangers of these drugs? As much as um, interesting, as much as just say no in the 80s might have been archaic and had no nuance to it, so it didn't really work, you know the right message for young people today? Just say no. That campaign is the right message today because saying yes to drugs, illicit drugs on the street, or even a drug you think is a prescription pill that you think came from someone's medicine cabinet, that is a scary, scary proposition that isn't like it was seven, eight years ago. So you can educate your employees. Guys, you can also create an environment where your employees are willing to talk about their struggles with mental health issues, 
their struggles with substances in general. Um, you know, this is not something I want to take a lot of time on, but how do you get to 100,000 people dying in America of overdose? You get there with a perfect storm in this country and in this state of issues. One of those issues is a mental health crisis that has never been worse since the pandemic. <coughs> if you're someone, again, working with employees every day, you please keep up with the new data on mental health and how your employees and their families are struggling. We've never seen anything like the levels of anxiety and depression and serious substance use and abuse. Guys, alcoholism is up almost 50% in the last three years in this country. Now, that's something that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, we, we don't talk a whole lot about that in our society, but you're seeing your employees struggle with mental health issues in ways that we've never seen before. And so many of them then turn to dangerous drugs to relieve their pain. Uh, by the way, the reason some of you know that that's true is because many of you in this room don't feel the way you felt before the pandemic. Like, like the level of mental health challenges in, in our world, in our com companies, in our communities, it is unbelievable. So you can also be a part through your leadership of bringing topics like mental health to the forefront um, and, and helping your employees and their families in regards to that. You're also going to be someone through your, your, your benefits management, your insurance navigation, who can help, um, help people make good decisions when they're interacting with the medical community. There are great alternatives to opioids that can be offered to someone. It's good, good, good to keep prescription opioids away from someone who's never used them before. Uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but so opioid overdoses are up 40, 50 percent in three years. Unbelievable. But did you know that prescriptions, legal opioids, are actually down during the past three years over 50 percent? So prescription opioids are no longer killing people. 80 to 90% of the deaths are these illegal drugs like fentanyl. So real interesting, right? We thought, we sat in rooms like this four years ago and said, take away people's prescriptions and this overdose crisis will, will subside. That's not what's happened. So we're gonna have to continue to work to keep prescription opioids away from people who have never used them before. That's a very, very good thing. But we could actually make a case that your employees are looking for relief from pain. And there's not opioids available to them anymore. They were on them previously or not available now. And they're seeking, uh, they're looking for love in all the wrong places, as the old song was put. Uh, when we break down 100,000 deaths, when you break that number down and really look at the three attributes of someone who is going to take these drugs and put their, their life at risk, you know what the three underlying attributes of someone who takes these drugs and, and might die? Number one, they feel hopeless. They have a sense of hopelessness economically, relationally. They feel hopeless and again, that's tied to mental health. That's tied to societal factors. Number two, they live in isolation. They might be connected to technology, but they live in isolation. How many of you, how many of your companies don't meet in person the way you did before? You don't go to the office the way you did before. That's not going back the other direction. Let me tell you something. Uh, corporate leaders, people that own companies, we figured something out. That is, people like to work at home and they work better at home. Oh, and by the way, they're paying their own overhead at home. These buildings are not gonna fill back up with employees like they did before, they're just not. So people are more in isolation than they were before in their jobs. They're, they're less inclined to go to community groups like their church or faith community um, in your own life. I bet you look at how much you go out, um, how much you are connecting with people, and it's probably less than before the pandemic. So they're hopeless, they feel hopeless. They live in isolation, as com they're connected to technology, 
but they're not connected to real people. They live in isolation. And the third is that they are in chronic physical and emotional pain. Chronic pain is a huge driver of this overdose crisis. And so your employees, what can you do? You can create an environment uh, where you are through your corporate leaders, through your founder, through your CEO, through your HR department, through trainings, through events, where you say, hey, listen, if you're, one of, if you're here, we want to help you if you're struggling, if you're feeling um, like you have a mental health issue, if you feel like you have a substance issue. This is a place where we want to help you, not a place where you're going to lose your job. These programs can be a great part of that. So look them up, and you can reach out to me if you're looking for more information. Narcan, as I mentioned to you before, it really has no active ingredient in it. There's two doses in here that affects adults, children, unless you have an opioid in your system. So I won't do this right now and waste it because these cost about $150, what I just gave you. We have a grant through DCF, so don't feel bad about taking these. They're very, very good to have. Uh, but I can open this up, squirt it in my nose right now. Nothing will happen. It tastes a little bit like seltzer water, so it doesn't taste good. But nothing will happen. Won't give me a headache, won't have any impact on me because I don't have opioids in my system. If I had opioids in my system, and watch a video on this later because it's pretty, pretty amazing. Technology, again, works for us and against us. This will bind on the receptors in our brain that the opioids are impacting, push those opioids off, and take and reverse the overdose. You know what happens when you overdose? It's pretty, pretty simple, but um, it's good for you to know this. What happens is you take opioids, and the opioids work on the receptors in your brain. They calm you, but in the quantities you're now taking, they actually calm those receptors to the place where they stop your breathing. You suffocate to death when you overdose. Your heart doesn't stop, you suffocate to death. So this instantly will reverse that. What you've seen is now these newer drugs. Have you seen this new drug, ISO? ISO is a brand new version of fentanyl in simplistic terms. That's not exactly true, but it's basically true. That is now 10 to 15 times more potent than fentanyl. And fentanyl was 50 times more powerful than morphine. So these drugs are often, this drug, FDA approved, uh, uh, naloxone, Narcan. You want to have this, um, again, the, the training is this, open it up, administer it in, in the nasal cavity, and if someone was overdosing, you could bring, this back, bring them back with this. I encourage every company in this state should have this as part of their first aid. Uh, a defibrillator costs $2,000, and you often have those. This is free most of the time now uh, because of um, the, the grants and the funding available. So there you go. Narcan's available to you. Google some videos, watch it, and have this anywhere the public is going to be gathering. Your employees um, could need it, and it could be very impactful. 41, what is that number? That is the average age of death for someone who is going to overdose in Florida. I think now that number keeps skewing lower, but it's, it might be closer to 40 now. It was as low as 39 at one point. So this is killing young people. This is a crisis that's killing young people. It's killing a generation uh, of, of good people who are struggling um, with substances that are more powerful than anything we've ever seen before. I actually brought this because I, uh, someone had handed me this last, just last week. Um, this is Justin Bruce Forrester. Justin died February 22nd, 2022, 38 days ago. Um, his family sent me this. Um, he lives in, we were in, we did our first meeting uh, on the other side in Santa Barbara, but his family s sent me this just a few days ago. Um, he was a young man who played football and um, did weightlifting and running, and he had an injury, a nagging injury, um, and started taking prescription pills. And, and um, 
Those prescriptions quickly led to a place where he was needing more and more. He wound up taking street drugs, and he was in, actually, uh, he was in recovery. He was doing, his family said he was doing so much better. He was in treatment, he had gotten help, and um, he wound up slipping, slipping up, taking one, relapsing one time, and he wound up dying and uh, overdosed and died. This, this, is the, this is the story of the overdose crisis now um, in, in our country. Um, if you look at all 100,000, that number of 100,000 on the chart, what you, thank you so much for closing that. If you look at 100,000 deaths in this country, almost 10,000 in Florida, closing in on 10,000 deaths a year in Florida, what you see is Justin and Amy and Sally and Mark and Raphael, you know, young people who are not bad people making bad decisions. They're just interacting with drugs that are the, the likes of which we've never seen before. But we believe that together we can make a huge impact. We can save lives. I, I didn't have a chance to get into this, but I will tell you uh, there are new forms of medication that are available that we we're just now coming to the forefront. If someone like Justin is struggling, we can give them medications that can keep them from overdosing over longer periods of time, keep them safe. But as long as we see Justin and others through the traditional lens of if you are struggling with drugs or just making bad choices, if your employees are struggling, they need to suck it up and do better, as long as we see people that way, we're never going to help them in our company. We're never going to help them in our church. We're never going to help them in our society. These are good people who have wound up, some of them, feeling hopeless, isolated. Um, they might be in pain. Pretty easy to find yourself in 2022 in those buckets. They make the wrong choice, and that choice costs them their life. So I just want to show you that because it's really easy to stereotype who's struggling who's dying. If those of you that live in Central Florida are going to be doing an event, feel free to come to this event April the 14th. You can contact me about how you can be involved in Project Opioid. We've got great leaders working on this crisis, um, but feel free to contact me about that. And you can contact me directly at uh, projectopioid.org. That's, that's our cell phone number. I just, want to, um, I just want to close by reading one thing. I read this last night, and it just really impacted me. His, his family, can you imagine? Can you imagine this is his mom? His mom. Um, I, I was reading this last night. I was thinking about this. and They had this final poem for him. And I just want to read one paragraph of it. Uh, Justin's last message to his family. Listen to the wind for my message of love. Watch the sun rise and set in the sky with me. Feel my existence encircle you with warm memories. I'm still there. Open your heart to know I am not gone. Um, you can be a lifeline to people in your company. You can be a lifeline to people in your community. And uh, um, Project Opioid is here to help you. Your company, your leadership can make a huge difference.